Right. So as I said, we will start with anticoagulants and antiplatelet agents and also thrombolytics. And uh, again, I don't think we'll be able to finish uh, or complete this lecture in one hour. So we will continue with this lecture tomorrow. All right. So we will start right away with the lecture. And um, this is our drug list, right? We have got platelet inhibitors. We have got anticoagulants. We have got thrombolytics. And we have got some antidotes for these, like uh, for heparin and for these thrombolytics and for warfarin as well, right? So let's quickly read it just to refresh your memories. And as I always said that you should always carefully read the slides that I show you. So we have got aspirin, teclopidine, which is not used these days, clopidogrel, prasugrel, ticagrelor, epsiximab, eptifibatide, tyrofibab, dipyridamol, and silostazole. These are, I mean, different groups of drugs with different mechanisms of action. Then here we have heparin and low molecular weight heparin, which um, have got certain features that heparin doesn't have. Then agratroban and bivalirudine, uh, dicirudine, these come from actually leech uh, and from the perinex, uh, tabigatran, rivaroxaban, apixaban, these are newer drugs which are known as non-vitamin K uh, anticoagulants or um, they are also known as uh, uh, new oral anticoagulants. Uh, uh, edoxaban and warfarin is a very old drug, okay? Then thrombolytics, we have got L-teplase, rituplase, tenecteplase, which are the ones that are commonly used. Streptokinase and urokinase are not used because they generate antibodies by the immune system. Then aminocaproic acid, phenic acid, protein acid, and vitamin K. I'll have to mute everything. There is some background noise. Okay, so I hope uh, you paid attention to what I said because I'm going to ask you a question over here in the next slide. And the question is this. You can go back and have a look over here quickly. I have one answer and the answer is B and let us see. Uh, yes, that is correct. Very good. So this is the right answer. How about this? You can go back and have a look over here. Well, it turns out that I didn't give you the names of the low molecular weight heparins, okay? So uh, actually we have got three. One of them is enoxaparin and the other is deltaparin and tinsaparin. You know, these are the ones that are low molecular weight heparins and we'll come to them uh, quickly. But let's go back into the history of uh, hemostasis, right? Now this goes back to 430 million years ago when we had these strange sort of animals which no longer exist, right? But they also had uh, um, a clotting system. And uh, uh, what do you think is this clotting system? Is this a good thing or is this a bad thing? Uh, the, the clots forming uh, in your blood vessels or whatever when you bleed uh, the formation of clots. So do you think it's a good thing or a bad thing? Any ideas? Well, well, you can say that uh, it is bad when we get clots inside the blood vessels, but overall it is a good thing, you know, because it's now for the last maybe uh, in some sense good and or bad, that is the right answer. But what I'm trying to tell you is that, you know, it's in the last, I don't know how many years, 10,000 years or uh, maybe 15,000 years that we have started living in, um, in a civilized manner. Uh, you know, the, according to estimates, the humans appeared on the earth somewhere around 150,000 to 200,000 years ago, right? And, and for the first 100,000 years, they were living in the wild. So they were fighting, they were running. And uh, even these animals, you know, who were uh, our ancestors, whatever they were, uh, according to science, 
uh, they were also always fighting and attacking each other and protecting themselves or uh, hunting their prey. So they were um, injuring each other. And when the injuries are caused, the animal is going to lose blood. And so overall, uh, this formation of blood clot is actually a good thing. If you look uh, um, at the process of evolution, right? And the way um, all these living beings have been living, right? So in mammalian blood coagulation system, now I say mammalian because we find these uh, few proteases and cofactors in all mammals. And uh, there are five basic proteases and we have got five basic cofactors, right? So factor eight, factor nine, factor 10, protein C, prothrombin, they are serine proteases and they break down uh, the next uh, clotting factor into its active form, right? And then we have got cofactors which are known as tissue factors, factor five, factor eight, protein S and thrombomodulin. And uh, the overall outcome of all this is the generation of fibrin. Because fibrin eventually, why are we controlling this or why are, why are we activating this? We are keeping it under, under strict control. We don't want unnecessary, but we want something when it is needed, all right? So fibrin is the eventual molecule uh, that uh, will cause clotting and it will bind everything together, all right? So comparative sequence analysis of the DNA or of these proteins support the existence of all these coagulation factors in all jawed vertebrates and strongly suggest that this system evolved 430 million years ago. And it is so important that it has been conserved in evolution. Whatever is conserved in evolution is very, very important for the survival of the animals or the species, all right? Okay, so uh, we do get some disorders of hemostasis. For example, thrombosis, we get diseases like myocardial infarction, deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary embolism, acute ischemic stroke, all of these are pretty dangerous diseases, right? Uh, bleeding disorders are less common like hemophilia A, factor eight deficiency, hemophilia B, which is factor nine deficiency, platelet disorders like von Willebrand disease, right? So just to give you this definition for the sake of completion, I hope, I, I'm sure you already know that coagulation is the process by which blood changes from liquid to a gel form, okay? It results in hemostasis, which means cessation of blood loss from a damaged vessel, and that is followed by inflammation and repair, okay? Thrombosis is the formation of blood clot inside the blood vessel, obstructing the blood flow. So you must differentiate between coagulation. This is also coagulation, but thrombosis occurs inside the blood vessel. And that is something unwanted, okay? <clears throat> thrombus and embolus, I hope you know this thing as well. A thrombus is a blood clot that forms in the blood vessel and sticks to the vessel wall. It's not uh, moving or it's not flowing with the blood. Embolus is anything that travels through the blood vessel until it reaches a vessel that is too narrow to let it pass. Can you give me some examples of emboli? Anyone, can you give me an example of em uh, an embolus or emboli? I mean, it could be anything that is flowing in the blood. It, you can have an air embolus. I've got an answer on the chat, let us see. Pulmonary embolism, yes, pul pulmonary embolism is due to a blood clot, but we can have a fat embolism and we can have um, different types of emboli, okay? Amniotic fluid embolism, yes, very good, that is correct. So embolus <clears throat> is a broad term, but it is something that is flowing uh, <clears throat> in the blood vessels. And you know that, <clears throat> for example, someone said that uh, we have got deep vein thrombosis or pulmonary embolism. So what happens in deep vein thrombosis, you have got a, uh, a thrombus in the vein of the leg, deep leg vein that breaks. A small part of it will break and then it will start flowing in the blood. You know that uh, the veins, they become bigger and bigger and bigger, right? So it will keep on flowing, it will not stop. 
because we eventually it will go to inferior vena cava and from there into the right heart, right uh, atrium, right ventricle, and then into the pulmonary um, artery, okay? Now, arteries, they become narrower and narrower and narrower. Veins become bigger and bigger and bigger. Arteries become narrower, narrower and narrower and narrower. So when it goes into the artery, it will get stuck somewhere. When it reaches a very small vessel that is too narrow to let it pass, and after that we will get infarction or we can call that pulmonary embolism, okay? In 99% of cases, an ambulance, an embolus is a small piece of thrombus that breaks off uh, from whatever thrombus is formed in the blood vessel, okay? So 1% we can get these other things in very unusual circumstances. So this is an example of a thrombus. This is that is sticking to the wall and it shows some atherosclerosis as well over here. And this is a small piece that will break away and it can go anywhere. If it goes to the brain, uh, the patient gets a stroke, all right, unfortunately. Right, so we have got two types of thrombi. We have got arterial thrombus, which is known as a white, uh, or, or which are known as white thrombi, and venous thrombus, they are known as red thrombi, because here we have got um, a higher number of platelets. So it most often occurs in medium-sized arteries. Uh, it often follows rupture and of an atherosclerotic plaque, okay? It is rich in platelets, that is why it appears paler than as compared to this one, right? So we call it white. It's not necessarily white like this slide, okay? And here it is, you know, this, um, the plaque, the fibrous cap of the plaque has ruptured and the platelets have aggregated over here. And this is triggered by blood stasis, uh, which is the cause of deep vein thrombosis, right? And may be caused by hypercoagulability of the blood, may be caused by uh, damage to the blood vessel, endothelial damage. If you remember the Virchow's triad, it, it states three uh, basic causes of uh, venous thrombosis, which is stasis, hypercoagulability, which is not very common, or the third one is injury to the vessel wall, okay? And it's rich in, fib uh, in fibrin and it, and it has entrapped RBCs. So it is darker in color. It's known as red thrombus, okay? And here is an example of, you know, RBCs entrapped in the uh, fibrin mesh over here, right? And these three gives you the Virchow's triad stasis, increased coagulability, and altered vessel wall. Okay, these are the three basic causes over here. Now, this is how it starts. A breach in the endothelium of blood vessels exposes platelets to collagen. So this is a wall, very smooth wall made of endothelial cells, which have got negative charges on their surface. But here's a, a sort of breach has occurred and you can see these collagen fibers. It is just a schematic, but the platelets have come in contact with that. So they have changed their shape. They have become sort of spiky, right? So let's uh, look uh, into a little more detail of the response to vascular injury. Uh, normally we have resting platelets, which are circulating in our uh, blood. Uh, what is the half-life of platelets? Anybody knows? How long do the platelets uh, stay in the blood, in the circulation? Can anybody tell me that? The half-life or the life, you can call it the lifespan, like the lifespan of RBCs is 100 to 120 days, right? Platelets uh, are there in, in the blood for about, and I've got one answer, uh, 10 to 14 days. Actually, it is 7 to 10 days, right? So uh, we'll check once again. I think it is seven to 10 days. Uh, so that is why, you know, we stop anti uh, these antiplatelet drugs one week before uh, surgeries. So resting platelets, endothelial cells secrete uh, PGI2, which is also known as prostacycline, and nitric oxide that acts as platelet inhibitor, uh, inhibitors of platelet activation, right? Thank you very much. So Nazem Ali has said it is seven to 10 days, so that is good. All right, uh, so what happens over here is that this PGI2, which is prostacycline, it is also a vasodilator and it decreases the concentration 
of um, a cyclic AMP, all right? And um, uh, sorry, increases uh, uh, inside platelet, it will eventually, uh, it is going to decrease calcium, right? So cyclic AMP, um, I suspect a little bit over here, uh, increased cyclic AMP or not, but uh, let's leave that, we'll come to that in another slide, okay? So this is how it starts. Exposure of platelets to collagen decreases PGI2 levels and activates platelets, right? So if there is no exposure, everything is good. We have got PGI2. But when there is exposure, then the following sequence of events takes place, right? Platelet adhesions, platelet will get activated. They will become more sticky to each other and they will adhere to this uh, surface, the collagen surface, and they will get activated. And platelets will release mediators. Platelets can release a lot of different types of mediators that I'll show you. And after that, the end result is platelet aggregation, formation of platelet plug, or then stabilization of that uh, plug, okay? So these are the things that are involved, GP, 2B, 3A, GP, 1B, which is uh, over here, and uh, which makes contact with von Willebrand factor, right? And we have got von Willebrand factor on the endothelial cells. We have got fibrinogen or fibrin that will, um, that will cross-link to platelets, fibronectin, alpha granules, uh, so alpha granules, you know, they contain a lot of things like activated platelets release thromboxane A2, adenosine diphosphate, serotonin platelet activating factor. They are all inside the alpha granules and they are released. You know, these alpha granules are being released only when the platelets get activated and they will lead to uh, downstream effects, which will lead to cross-link formation and platelet plug formation, right? So the bottom line is that when the endothelium is injured, platelets adhere to and cover the exposed collagen. This triggers release of calcium from cytosolic stores inside the platelet, resulting in platelet activation and formation of platelet plug, okay? So I see that Basit has raised his hand. Do you have a question, Basit? Or you are just, you just clicked by mistake. Right, so let's keep going with the lecture. So here is a resting platelet, right? This is an electron micrograph of a resting platelet. Uh, the platelets transform from disc to irregular shapes. They become spiky when they get activated, all right? And we have seen the process of activation of the platelets and they form a platelet plug like this, which will uh, cover the exposed collagen and start the process of repair, or they can start the process of uh, formation of a, a clot or a thrombus, okay? So, here, once again, you know, receptors on the surface of platelets are activated by, I'll show you what receptors we have. There are not many. So they are activated by a number of substances. For example, ADP. So if you have a drug that blocks ADP, you can block platelet activation. So that will be called an antiplatelet drug, okay? A thrombexane A2, anything, anything that blocks the formation of thromboxane, which is a product of COX-1 enzyme activation, right? It is the COX-1 pathway. So anything that blocks COX-1 enzyme, like aspirin, so that is going to block platelet aggregation, we call that antiplatelet drug. Serotonin, the platelet activating factor, thrombin, all these can activate platelets, right? And I've shown you in the previous slide as well. So this is what I'm showing you over here is a damaged blood vessel, exposure of platelets to collagen and collagen um, uh, will activate platelets. They will release from alpha granules, a lot of substances that are going to activate the clotting cascade. Right? So what does the clotting, I've omitted a lot of clotting factors, but eventually prothrombin will be converted to thrombin, right? And what does thrombin do? Thrombin converts fibrinogen, which is to fibrin, okay? So fibrin is the end product that we are looking for. And fibrin is going to 
uh, trap everything. It's going to form a meshwork in which you will have platelets and RBCs and uh, you slowly and gradually the clot will stabilize, right? So this is a picture of a clot that has been taken out from somewhere. And this is an electron micrograph and you see so many RBCs entrapped within the, um, within the fibrin meshwork, this whitish looking thing, all right? Actually, these are not real colors. This is known as a false electron, falsely colored electron micrograph. Electron micrographs are always grayscale, right? They don't show colors, but there are softwares to color them, okay? So this is going to be our um, figure of platelets on which we are going to base the mechanism of action or through this figure, I'm going to show you the mechanism of action of different groups of antiplatelet drugs, all right? So this is the endothelium, endothelial cells. Beneath that, we have got collagen. This is one Willebrand factor, and this is GP, one glycoprotein 1b, okay? GP stands for glycoprotein. And you see that it's the glycoprotein that binds to one Willebrand factor, not under normal situations, but when it is exposed to collagen, okay? Then we have got thromboxane A2, and you see all of these receptors. You see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. They are passing through the membrane seven times. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. What are these receptors? Anybody knows the names of these receptors? Do you think these are G protein coupled receptors? Yes, they are G protein coupled receptors, okay? So thromboxane A2 can activate this GQ. They are mostly GQ, one is GI. So what will GQ do? GQ does, um, GQ increases the level of calcium inside the cells, okay? And calcium will have further downstream effects of activating this molecule that I'll show you in a minute. So thrombin has its receptor that will activate the platelets. Then these are two receptors known as P2Y1 and P2Y12. This one is important because we have drugs. Uh, there is a question, warfarin or heparin, which one is more safer in minor thrombosis? Uh, Minor, you mean small because you have written M-I-N-E-R. Is it a, a C? Um, we, we, we usually give heparin if the thrombosis is there. We will discuss this when we come to these drugs, all right? At the moment, we are discussing antiplatelet drugs. So we will discuss these drugs as well. Okay, so when we come to these drugs, then I will explain to you their therapeutic uses as well. So I was saying that P2Y12 is important because we have got certain drugs that block these receptors, okay? Uh, seven pass receptors are the G protein coupled receptors, okay? They pass through the membranes seven times. Okay, then we have got 5-hydroxytryptamine, uh, -hydrox which you know is serotonin. This activates the receptor and eventually all of these are going to cause expression of glycoprotein 2B3A and another activated platelet will have the same protein and between them is fibrin molecule, which will form the cross links. So the platelets will stick to each other, right? So this is the process of activation of the platelets. Now we have got drugs, okay? <clears throat> this is COX-1 enzyme, cyclooxygenase, which is producing thromboxane A2, right? Uh, just to ask you one question, you know, COX-1 enzyme is there in so many uh, cells, but why don't we make thromboxane A2 in the other cells? Why do we make it only in the platelets? Any answer? Because in between, there is another enzyme which is known as which is known as thromboxane synthase. And this enzyme is present only in the platelets. It's not present in other cells. That is why we form thromboxane A2 only in the platelets, right? So aspirin is the one that blocks uh, the formation of thromboxane A2 because it blocks COX-1 enzyme. Then I said this one is important, um, uh, P2Y12 receptor. We have got many drugs, teclopidine, clopidogrel, prasugrel, and ticagrelor. Okay, teclopidine is not used. Uh, then um, this is the pathway of activation. You know, look at this, platelet is 
making thrombin and it is releasing thrombin which will activate it. Same way platelet is uh, making thromboxane and it will release thromboxane and um, it is activating itself. What is this pathway known as? When a cell makes a substance that activates itself, what is that known as in terms of endocrinology or we, we call it autocrine, autocrine stimulation. If it stimulates a neighboring cell, we call it a paracrine stimulation. If it stimulates a distant cell, we call that endocrine stimulation, okay? So this autocrine stimulation, right? So this is fibrin, which will cause, uh, cause cross-links between different platelets and we get a platelet plug. And we have got certain drugs which uh, inhibit GP2B3A, epsiximab, eptifibatide, and tyrofibam. So we have got three groups. We have got aspirin, we have got P2Y12 inhibitors or ADP inhibitors, and 2B3A inhibitors, all right? Uh, platelet aggregation inhibitors inhibit COX-1, GP2B3A, and ADP receptors three groups, okay? Because these agents have got different mechanism of action, you can use them together. And they will have a synergistic effect. And I, I'm sure you all know that the most common combination that we use is aspirin and clopidogram, okay? Most commonly used in hospitals, especially after myocardial infarction, we give them for a period of at least one year, okay? Right, so here is aspirin. We'll start with aspirin, okay? And last in the last lecture, I raised a point. This is aspirin 81 milligram. Why not 80 milligram? Why not 82 milligram? Is 81 milligram the most effective dose? Is it more effective than 75 milligram? Is it more effective than 85 milligram? Anybody knows why this, why this 81 milligram? Does it make sense to you? All right, um, uh, I'll explain this to you, right? Uh, before, because, because this is something interesting. Many people do not know. Even I ask uh, some pharmacologists and they do not know the teachers, right? Uh, previously, a long time back, you know, uh, we were using a system which was known as uh, apothecary, apothecary system. Sorry, I don't exactly know the name of that system, but it was something like apothecary system. In that, we were not using grams and milligrams. This is metric system. It was before this was discovered. So there we used to have grains and scruples, right? We, a, a grain of barley was the standard measurement. And one grain of barley was actually 65 milligram. So initially, uh, you know, this is still used traditionally by some companies, okay? So initially what happened was, uh, this, is, this is the dose 150 milligram stat, 75 milligram daily. Uh, uh, this Abdul Fatawa Saeed has written this. Uh, are you writing the dose of aspirin? Anyway, uh, I was discussing this 81 milligram, the history behind it. Now, five grains actually weigh 325 milligram, and we call that a full dose of aspirin in case of antiplatelet effect, right, in, in terms. Now, now, that is the history that 325 milligram, how did we get 325 milligram? Because five grains, they were said to be full dose, and that was, now, when we decided that we should give a low dose of aspirin, we decided that we should give one by fourth of the full dose. And that is why it is 81 milligram. One by fourth of 325 milligram is 81 milligram. So it doesn't mean that this is an optimal dose or it is more effective than 80 milligram and 82 milligram. It is just something in history that it came down to 81 milligram, all right? All right, so let's look at aspirin. Stimulation of platelets by thrombin uh, collagen and ADP results in activation of membrane phospholipases. So membrane phospholipid will be broken down to arachidonic acid and COX-1 is going to act on that and it will produce prostaglandin H2. And if you have got um, thromboxane synthase, then it will produce thromboxane A2 from this prostaglandin H2. And when you give aspirin, aspirin is going to block this COX-1. 
in the platelets, all right? It blocks in other uh, cells as well, but here it is, it's a low dose, so it will block in platelets. And when it blocks this, this COX-1, the metabolism will be diverted towards the production of prostacycline. So what we get is a small amount of thrombexin A2 and a larger amount of prostacycline, which is a good thing, okay? Prostacycline prevents platelet aggregation. So this is the mechanism of action of aspirin. Aspirin acetylates serine residue on the active site of COX-1 enzyme. And it inhibits that covalently. It binds covalently. Whenever something binds covalently, it is permanent. It is irreversible, okay? Aspirin irreversibly inactivates COX-1, unlike the other NSAIDs. And suppression of platelet aggregation lasts for the lifespan, which is seven to 10 days, okay? The dose is 75 to 325 milligram. 325, we say, is the full dose. If a patient um, that you have with myocardial infarction, you must give him a full dose of aspirin immediately, all right? And it causes 75 milligram causes a complete inactivation of platelets. So anywhere between 75 to 162 milligram is said to be standard antiplatelet dose, okay? So this is salicylic acid. It was identified in willow bark exactly 100 years ago, maybe 105 years ago or 104 years ago, not sure. The therapeutic uses is to reduce the incidence of recurrent MI, decrease mortality from MI, and uh, I don't know what this lizard, or is it a lizard or a squirrel? Can somebody tell me? Anyway, whatever it is, okay? Uh, so prophylactic treatment of transient cere cerebral ischemia. So these are the uses in pharmacokinetics. It's well absorbed from the GIT, rapidly hydrolyzed to salicylic acid in the liver. Aspirin is acetyl salicylic acid. You know, this is salicylic acid. You attach uh, this green, this group as acetyl group. So it becomes aspirin, right? With large doses of aspirin, the elimination kinetics shift from first order to zero order kinetics, okay? We have got three drugs, just three drugs. High doses of aspirin, phenytoin, and ethanol that follow zero order kinetics, okay? Half-life of aspirin is 15 to 20 minutes and salicylic acid is longer, three to 12 hours. Adverse effects are prolonged bleeding time. GI bleeding is the most common side effect. And all of these drugs, you know, that we use antiplatelet, anticoagulants, they have a risk of hemorrhagic stroke, especially the anticoagulants. GI bleeding is there. So ibuprofen competes with aspirin for binding COX-1. So you should separate these two drugs by two hours. Either you take aspirin 60 minutes to two hours before that, or seven to eight hours after that, because the half-life of ibuprofen is longer than this aspirin, okay? Right, so there this thing is back. There is a question. Let us see whether you can answer this question or not. All right, so I've shown you the drug list two or three times. Let us see whether you remember that or not. So I'm asking you a drug that blocks ADP receptors, which is P2Y12 receptor, right? Any answer? All right, so while you try to answer, let me check this, I was waiting for an important. All right, okay. There is one answer, two answers, which is A. No, warfarin, we are not yet at warfarin. One, someone has written D, uh, Muhammad Jamal has written D, which is the right answer. It is clopidogrel, okay? The right answer is clopidogrel. It's not alteplase. Alteplase is a thromb thrombolytic 
drug. We have not yet done that. And yes, some people have uh, written D and D is the right answer. You know, warfarin, the mechanism of action is it inhibits vitamin K epox epoxide reductase enzyme. Okay, let me see clopidogrel. Yes, Nazim has written clopidogrel, which is the right answer. This amino caproic acid inhibits plasminogen activation. It is actually um, an antidote for these thrombolytic uh, drugs. Okay, alteplase like alteplase. This is a, a sort of antidote for this one. So, uh, alteplase converts plasminogen to plasmin, heparin, antithrombin mediated inhibition of thrombin, and aspirin. We have just seen inactivates uh, COX1. So, the correct answer is clopidogrel. Right. So, now we are going, we have done aspirin, and now we are going to the next group of drug, which is P2Y12 receptor antagonist and clopidogrel. Uh, was one of them, right? So these are the four drugs, uh, and there is something important about these four drugs, uh, which is uh, just please give me one minute. Uh, this is. All right. Okay. So uh, these drugs block binding of adenosine diphosphate to PTY12 receptor. So when ad adenosine diphosphate binds to this receptor, platelets are inactivated. So that in turn inhibits activation of GP2B3A, which is the final step in platelet aggregation. Uh, uh, Ticagrelor binds reversibly, other bind irreversibly to this receptor. So they will be effective for the lifespan of the platelets. Right, so we have got these drugs, ticagrelor tablets taken orally. Clopidogrel, uh, uh, Plavix is a very famous brand name. Again, tablets taken orally. Prasugrel tablets taken orally. That's the out of administration. Uh, Teclopidine discontinued. It causes severe side effects like bleeding, all right? So inhibition of platelet aggregation is achieved in, this is important. See, please note that here it will take one to three hours. When you start ticagrelor, it takes one to three hours for platelet aggregation. Clopidogrel, three to five days. Uh, Prasugrel, two to four hours. Okay. Now, because of this thing, one to three hours and two to four hours and three to five hours, we use them for slightly different purposes. Okay. These two drugs we use, as I'll show you in the next slide, we use them before a PCI. If you decide to take a patient for PCI, you, we actually use these drugs before the PCI because um, uh, when you are going to do angioplasty or place a stent, you know, then you use these drugs. Okay. Anyway, it's written in the therapeutic uses. So this is the mechanism of action. Damaged endothelial cells, ADP will be released and that will activate the platelet increased calcium concentration that is going to activate um, glycoprotein uh, 2B3A and that will form cross links with other platelets through fibrin, okay? So let's look at clopidogrel for prevention of cardiovascular events in recent MI and stroke. Uh, you see, so stroke should not be a hemorrhagic stroke, okay? It should be an ischemic stroke. I hope you understand that. Uh, for patients with established atherosclerosis, we give aspirin. By the way, you know, these days they are saying that aspirin is protective against colorectal cancer as well. Uh, for prophylaxis in unstable angina and uh, NSTEMI, for prophylaxis of thrombotic events in PCI. So you see, we are using it before PCI as well. Clopidogrel, but it has got a longer half-life, but you can still use it, okay? Teclopidine has serious hematologic toxicities. It is not used, okay? This is again prophylaxis in PCI for acute coronary syndrome, right? This is just mm, uh, the procedure for placing a stent in the blocked blood vessel. And again, ticagrelor for prophylaxis in PCI, unstable angina, MI. So all of these drugs are used before PCI. Okay, that's an important point to note. And the other um, indications, I hope you already know them. Now, pharmacokinetics, these agents require loading doses. 
for quick antiplatelet effect. If you remember, I said Plavix, I showed you 75 by 300 milligram, right? So in case of clopidogrel, which is the most commonly used drug, um, the loading dose is 300 milligram. And I've just given you from general basics pharmacology, the formula for uh, calculating the loading dose, okay? Volume of distribution and plasma concentration that you want to achieve divided by the bioavailability. And you see, it says that Plavix generated sales figures of $2.6 billion, so you know how uh, widely it is used, you know. And these drug companies, they are rich, you know, just reading today or yesterday that they, during this COVID um, epidemic, uh, Pfizer had a profit of about $30 billion through the vaccines that we all got, okay? Right. So food does not interfere with absorption. Uh, except for teclobitin, which we do not use. Metabolism is hepatic by CYP450. Elimination, both renal and fecal means through the liver. Clopidogrel, therapeutic efficacy, it's basically a prodrug, okay? Therapeutic efficacy of clopidogrel relies on enzyme that converts it to its active metabolite. So clopidogrel is not active, when it goes into the body, it is activated by an, by an enzyme, CYP2D, to CYP2C19. Now this enzyme, this is uh, uh, an important point to remember that this enzyme has got genetic polymorphisms. Some people make more of this enzyme, some people make less of these enzymes. So those who make less of these enzymes, they will not be able to activate clopidogrel sufficiently. You got the point? So it is, it is recommended to do genetic tests for these people. Genetic polymorphisms with poor metabolizers of this enzyme lead to reduced clinical response. So poor meta metabolizers on genetic testing may be prescribed prosugrel or ticagrel, ticagrel or, all right? But I don't think anyone does uh, this uh, genetic testing Right, we just look at the clinical response. Avoid drugs that inhibit CYP2C19, such as omeprazole and azomeprazole. okay? Adverse effects, all of these are going to prolong bleeding time. They can cause bleeding as well. Uh, teclopidine is associated with severe hematologic reactions. Uh, I'm showing it to you again and again, but it's not, uh, it's not used, okay? Clopidogrel causes fewer adverse reaction and the incidence of neutropenia is lower. However, thrombotic thrombocytic purpura has been reported as an adverse effect for both clopidogrel and prasugrel, but not for ticagrelor. Ticagrelor has got other side effects, okay? Prasugrel uh, is contraindicated in patients with history of transient ischemic attack or uh, stroke, okay? In, in these cases, you have to be very careful. Right, now there is a black box warning. Uh, Prasugrel carries a black box warning for bleeding. Ticagrelor carries black box warnings for bleeding and diminished effectiveness when concomitant use of aspirin doses above 100 milligram. But usually we use aspirin lower than 100 milligram, less than 100 milligram, okay? Another question for you, let's read this quickly. All right, this should, this should be an easy one for you. All right, I got one answer, which is uh, we are asking about the mechanism of action of aspirin. Okay, it included aspirin. So mechanism of aspirin, competitive inhibition. No, it's, uh, aspirin is not a competitive inhibitor. Uh, someone has written irreversible, number C is irreversible, blockade of ADP receptor. No, aspirin doesn't act on ADP receptors. 
E is the right answer, which is irreversible acetylation of cyclooxygenase. We said that it binds to a serine residue and it is irreversible binding. It is a covalent bond formation. All right, yes, that is good. E is the correct answer. Another question. Right. Let us see whether you understand the question or not. All right, so I have highlighted the key sentence over here, which means that responses to ADP are inhibited, which means that the ADP receptor is occupied. Something is already binding to ADP receptor. What is ADP receptor? It is also known as P2Y12, and the correct answer is C, right? That it is clopidogrel. Clopidogrel is a non-competitive antagonist of ADP. It's a prodrug that causes largely irreversible, that is for the lifetime of platelet, irreversible inhibition of platelet aggregation by blocking ADP binding to G inhibitory coupled receptors, all right? Okay, so we will do this last group and then we will stop. Okay, we have done this as sprint. We have done this P2Y12 receptor blockers. And now we are going to uh, look at these GP glycoprotein 2B3A inhibitors, which are epsiximab, epifibatide, and tyrofibam. Okay, so let's look at their mechanism of action. These are two platelets, right? One platelet is over here, and the other is here, and they have been linked. They have been cross-linked. Uh, this is activated platelet. This is also activated platelet. And these are GP2B3A receptors, and they have been cross-linked by fibrin. So that is what happens in activated platelets. You know, they get um, attached to each other and maybe many other platelets are attached through these uh, molecules. So we get a platelet plug, okay? And the GP2B3 receptors gets input from a lot of, this is the ultimate effect of activation. So what activates the platelets? Thrombin receptors, uh, P2Y12 receptors, ADP receptor that we call, serotonin activates it, epinephrine activates platelets, plasmin activates, platelet aggregating factor, collagen, right? So many things. But when you give inhibitors, the inhibitors, you know, epsiximab, eptifibatide, tyrofibam, they are going to block this, okay? They are going to, and this is what is going to happen. The inhibitor is here, so the platelets will not be able to aggregate. So the end result is, they are preventing or inhibiting platelet aggregation. GP2B3A inhibitors prevents the formation of fibrin crosslinks. The formation of platelet plug will be prevented. So epsiximab, it is a MAB. What, what does this stand for? Anybody knows what this MAB is? Why does it have this MAB? All right, it is a monoclonal antibody. Okay, it stands for monoclonal antibody. We are using a lot, this one is old, but these days a lot of new monoclonal antibodies are coming in. So it is a chimeric monoclonal antibody. What is chimeric? I will explain that to you when we do cancers. Actually, I've already uh, posted the lectures on anti-cancer drugs. Then eptifibatite is a peptide. Tyrofibane is a non-peptide. Uh, both block the site on GP2BA that binds to fibrinogen or fibrin, okay? So eptifibatite is derived from a protein found in the venom of this pygmy rattlesnake, which is a small snake, just 21 inches. But you know, sometimes we get anticoagulants. This is the mechanism of action of the poison. It is an anticoagulant, especially in vipers. They are, um, uh, they are toxic in the blood, okay? Uh, so, 
Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think one person is leaving. So thanks for attending. We are just coming to the end, all right? Right, so therapeutic use given IV along with heparin and aspirin. These are the drugs, you know, we, this is, uh, these are all IV, okay? Aptifibatide injection, okay? 5 ml vial, so the route of administration is parenteral, uh, rather IV. They are used for myocardial infarction, acute coronary syndrome, unstable angina, and STEMI, okay? And then uh, we have adverse effects, which is bleeding and pharmacokinetics. These drugs are given by IV bolus, followed by infusion uh, to achieve platelet inhibitions in about 30 minutes, okay? Epsiximab mechanism is unknown. Uh, after IV infusion, the platelet effect persists for 24 to 48 hours. Eptifibatide and tyrofibane, both agents are rapidly cleared. Platelet function is restored within four to eight hours of discontinuation. So that means if you want to have uh, continued uh, inhibition of platelet activation, you have to continue the uh, infusion, okay? But usually we start with other oral drugs. Uh, Eptifibatide by kidney, styrofibane, unchanged by kidney and liver. Okay, and that is all for today because our time is almost up now. It's already 50 minutes. So thank you very much for attending this lecture. If there are any questions, you can ask me. Otherwise, we will continue with this lecture tomorrow. And from today, I'll give the link to the lectures only to those who attend the lectures. All right. So I'll see you all tomorrow, hopefully.